Tubes in London are a winter closet shared by the entire town. Thick coats and puffy jackets are stuffed into a confined space and when the door of the closet opens, walking jackets push their way out. I remember giggling when I walked into someone on the tube in the winter. It amused me how we bounced off each other. But then we arrived at King's Cross and people scattered like a pile of baby earthworms when you lift up a rock. I took the seat nearest to the door. An old woman sat across from me. She wore an ill-fitting brown trench coat that I imagined she bought in her healthier days. Her light eyes matched her straight hair that ended below her ears. She wore jewelry that fashion enthusiasts would deem vintage. She gripped a rolled up newspaper in her left hand. I noticed she wore no ring. I wondered what her story was. Could she be lonely? Or maybe she just never needed a man to make her happy. When I thought about her life that must have been, I felt young and inexperienced, but I couldn't have imagined that the same woman would make me feel insecure, vulnerable, and guilty all in the next 10 minutes. The 70-something British woman stared straight at me. Even when I looked away, in the side of my vision, I could see her scanning my boots, my knees, my skirt, my shirt, my face, my eyes, and then focusing on something above my eyes, most likely the poof of hair on top of my head that never behaves. I tucked loose strands behind my ear, pulled my skirt down a little, and looked over at her. To my discomfort, her eyes were still fixed on me. I looked around and realized I was the only Indian person in the car. The woman continued to stare at me while tapping her rolled up newspaper to her palm. I gave a feeble smile but got nothing back. I tried to play a game on my phone but my snowboard crashed right away. I pulled out a candy cane from my bag and began, suck, began sucking on the bottom like I always do. Shit, it just made her stare more. I stopped and held the sticky cane in my fist. I was becoming restless and the woman looked like she was going to say something to me. Suddenly, I felt like she may make a comment about my clothes. So I, lo so I casually checked the buttons on my shirt. They were fine. So why was this woman staring at me? She scanned me again and my knee began to shake. The tension was now palpable. She stood up and walked towards me. My fear took a form I could have never anticipated. It was 23rd March, 1931, when Bhagat Singh, a young man at the forefront of the Indian freedom struggle, was shot in the head in front of 20,000 spectators on the local cricket ground in my village. The tiger had been turned into a lamb in the play they called the British Raj. He slapped his chest twice and said, tell them that the British attack from the back, but Indians have always taken bullets on their chest. Shooting Singh on the ground sent a message to the Indians. The cricket ground turned into a shooting range by night and the British had sniffed the lies on honest locals. Branches of trees were hammered into the ground like cricket stumps, and upside-down clay pots were balanced on them. The biggest pot was imagined to be the Viceroy's head. My father told me of the first time he accompanied my dada to the shooting range. It was cold, he said. The ochre ground became a dark desert. Men held up their guns and shot in the dark. You could smell the gunpowder as if it was Diwali, but then you could taste it, and you knew that this was no festival. The fucking British, my dad would say, forgetting that he was swearing in front of his daughter. Bhagat Singh was only 24. He would have gotten us freedom years before Gandhi, and he would have made the Brits suffer. Anger, sharp as hail, rained on the shooting range, and its echo rekindled the freedom struggle. The woman took the seat next to me. All the attention on me, on me, for no apparent reason. These are the scandalous incidents you read about in British tabloids. By the intensity of the woman's eyes and her pursed lips, I knew, I just knew in some deep, eternally wise part of my soul that this woman was racist and was about to say something to me. I strengthened my stand to convey to her that I'm not going to take her bullshit. I probably speak better English than her grandkids do. If she offended me, I would swear at her so violently in her own tongue that everyone in the car would know exactly what she said and that bigotry is alive and well. Hello, the woman beside me said. 
I turned to her in one swift movement. My skin burned under its dark surface. Why? Why was she talking to me? And what was that accent? How many stations till Victoria? The words fell upon my ears, and I imagined a coy born girl. The accent was Russian. Russian. This woman wasn't even British. Suddenly, I was a clay pot that had taken a bullet on the shooting range. My thoughts were just broken clay, but dangerous, like shards of glass. I close my eyes and I'm back at the shooting range. The lingering gunpowder settles in my throat. I had imagined the whole story. The woman in the train had transformed into a woman in her youth, walking under a white lace umbrella to protect her English skin from the Indian sun. I take a shot in the dark and I miss. I had been quick to imagine my granduncles watching the woman's horse as she admonished them for missing, missing a spot. I could see my grand aunts picking up her dirty clothes as she demanded the wash be done quicker than humanly possible. I take a shot again. This time I don't miss. I walk to the broken clay pot and its remains have turned into mirrors. Under the moonlight, I see my face reflected in over 50 tiny mirrors and I succumb to the realization that my heart beat hysterically, not from fear, but from guilt. Back in the train, I tightened my fist and my candy cane snapped. I opened my palm and saw that it had melted. My sweat was red, like blood on my hands. Thank you.